Hello, and welcome to the second episode of The Pills, or Prescribing and Interface Learning Sessions. This is a podcast brought to you by Nottingham and Nottinghamshire ICB. We created this podcast to deliver the latest APC updates in a quick and easy to listen format. We hope you will find it useful. In today's episode, we will cover the Type 2 Diabetes Guideline update, and we have a guest to take us through the main changes. Hi, Len, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Can you tell us a few words about yourself? Hi there, thank you for having me. I'm Lynn, I'm a pharmacist. I work for the ICB, supporting the work of the APC. Thanks. You've been involved in a Type 2 Diabetes Guideline update, along with a series of other healthcare professionals. Can you tell us briefly what triggered this update? There has been a desire from clinicians to update our local Type 2 Diabetes Guidelines for some time. American and European guidance has recommended that we use medications with evidence for improving cardiorenal outcomes for a while. But the update to NICE guidance that happened last year gave us the national guidance to support the change. What is the most significant change to the guideline and how will this change affect prescribing? The big change in terms of treatment choices is that the SGLT2 class of medications, also known as Flozins, are recommended much earlier in the treatment pathway for those with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease, heart failure or CKD. For example, for those with established cardiovascular disease or heart failure, An SGLT2 inhibitor is recommended as part of first-line therapy alongside metformin. So as soon as the tolerability of metformin is confirmed, an SGLT2 inhibitor should also be prescribed. Previously, you would have waited to start a second-line treatment option when adequate glycemic control wasn't achieved with metformin. And just to confirm, can any prescriber start an SGLT2 inhibitor? Yes, absolutely. The SGLT2 inhibitors have a number 3 classification on the APC's traffic line system, so any prescriber can initiate them in line with the guideline recommendations. Okay, so why are SGLT2 inhibitors considered better than they were perhaps previously? We now have clinical trial evidence for three of the SGLT2 inhibitors, so in no particular order that's empagliflozin, dipagliflozin and canagliflozin that shows that in addition to improving glycemic control, these medications also have cardiovascular benefits in terms of reducing heart failure exacerbations and mortality, and they also have favourable renal outcomes such as reducing the progression of CKD and progression to dialysis. And These benefits are most marked in those with established disease, hence why it is those with established disease that are being targeted in this guideline. Okay, and what are the major changes we bring with this guideline? Well, first of all, um, we have tried to give the guideline an overall visual refresh to make it a bit more enticing to look at. And then the first section of the guideline is mainly about lifestyle changes, and we all know these are so key to improving diabetes care. We have tried to improve that section by bringing together various links and guidance that may be useful to consider when thinking about that aspect. Then in the second section about medication choices, we have updated the treatment flow charts and medication tables, but we have tried to focus a bit more on the points to consider when choosing medications for individual patients. There are links to relevant patient information leaflets and things like that. We've also renewed the insulin section to highlight the commonly used insulins and the differences between them. There is some information in there to support the use of biosimilar insulins where they are available. And how will we support prescribers in adopting the new guidance? We are actively sharing the updated local guidance with colleagues and we would like to encourage them to look at it. Um, To find it, go to the diabetes section of the guidelines on the APC website or it is linked to any of the formula entries for diabetes medications on the joint formulary. Then, as patients are reviewed, encourage care in line with it. Okay, and who can we contact if we have further questions about the guidance? In the first instance, it may be worth talking to your local medicines optimization pharmacist and then they can contact us if needed. Otherwise, there is an email address for the APC that people can use. The contact details will be on the APC website or any of the bulletins that come out from the APC. Thank you very much, Len, for sharing such useful information. I appreciate this is a big topic and this is only a snippet of the work. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you found this useful. 
Remember, you can find the latest episode of our podcast on the APC website and the publications. If you would like to see a more detailed presentation of the latest interface update, you can access the webinar recording on the APC website under the same section. If you have any feedback or you would like us to cover a specific topic, please get in touch by emailing or leaving us a comment. Goodbye!